And so it is into this setting that the United States launched uh, into the war that would really transform uh, American diplomacy and America's place in the world. The Spanish-American War, or as I have it phrased here, the Spanish-Cuban-American War, which a number of historians have begun uh, inserting Cuban into the title of this, the war for reasons I'll discuss momentarily. Uh, this war took place in 1898, and as we approach the war, uh, the year or two leading up to it, American diplomacy uh, by this time was hinging on two significant and in some ways um, uh, opposing ideas. One of them was the thought of continued expansion, uh, the, the continued thought of this idea of manifest destiny, which we've talked about uh, a number of times earlier in the course. Uh, this is also in keeping with Frederick Jackson Turner and the frontier thesis. Uh, what are we going to do now? Well, in fact, we're, we're going to continue expanding. We're going to look for further places to uh, expand into, meaning the Pacific Ocean and out across the Pacific to places like Hawaii and the Philippines and elsewhere. The other theme uh, is the continued emphasis on the Monroe Doctrine, uh, meaning the protection of the American hemisphere. And so both of these themes play a role in the outbreak of this Spanish-American War because it is in fact um, growing Spanish uh, activity in Cuba that is going to spark American involvement in this. But as we look at the background of this war, it actually begins as a Cuban struggle for independence. Cuba was, in fact, one of the oldest colonies on Earth. It had fallen under Spanish control. This goes literally all the way back to the days of Columbus uh, in the early 1500s who had planted the Spanish flag in Cuba. And from that point to the late 1800s, Spain had controlled Cuba. But the Cubans had begun fighting for their independence. And by the 1890s, in fact, they were... Um, doing well in this war against Spain, and they were coming close to winning their independence from Spain. And so the Spanish response is to crack down viciously against the Cubans, and in some ways to cling to their dominance uh, in any way they could think of. The Spanish sent a vicious general whose name was Valeriano Butcher Weiler. Valeriano Weiler. Uh, and Butcher Weiler determined that he would control the Cubans by any means necessary. This is in the mid to late 1890s. And it installed a brutal and vicious regime to keep the Cubans under control. One of the things that Butcher Weiler did was he instituted uh, what were called the reconcentrado, the concentration camps, in essence. And they were not necessarily death camps in the sense that people were systematically killed, but conditions in these camps were horrific, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Cubans were put into these prison camps where disease ran rampant and starvation was common, um, torture was common, and uh, conditions were simply awful. More than a hundred thousand Cubans were killed uh, during this period of rule under Butcher Weiler. What does any of this have to do with the United States, you might wonder? Well, in some ways, this relates to the Monroe Doctrine and the protection of the American Hemisphere. In other ways, there, uh, this goes back to a long tradition of American interest in Cuba. If any of you have been down to Key West, for instance, um, in Florida, 
you might note there's a sign there at the tip of Florida pointing in the direction of Cuba, and it says Cuba 90 miles away. Um, in certain ways, Cuba is right there. It's a very near neighbor of ours. Um, the United States had uh, toyed off and on with the idea of annexing or taking over Cuba, making it uh, a United States state. So we're always interested in what's happening in Cuba, and especially when there's something so chaotic as this, so awful and horrific as this, the United States' attention is going to be turned uh, to what's going on in Cuba. The President of the United States during this period was William McKinley. And William McKinley, as I've mentioned, showing this concern for what's going on in Cuba, opened uh, a line of communication with Spain in 1897 and continuing in 1898 to try to get the Spanish to curb uh, the activities that they were engaged in in Cuba. We didn't mind, honestly, that Cuba was a colony of Spain. We weren't trying to take Cuba away from Spain. Um, merely to get the Spanish to cease the horrific tactics that they were using in their control of Spain. What we see is that the Spanish were not terribly responsive or open to American suggestions at that time. And so, in fact, in 1898, uh, relations between Spain and the United States broke down. There are a number of different things we can look at and examples um, leading to this breakdown in relations. I'll mention three specific things here. One of them was the growing prominence of newspapers and journalism during this time. I spoke in an earlier lecture very briefly about the penny press and the growing um, prominence of newspapers, even some early magazines during this time. One aspect of those newspapers we might describe as yellow journalism. This was a, a phrase that was um, that developed out of this time, particularly because of one of the uh, comic strips at that time, and the ink in the in the paper was yellow. Um, this yellow journalism um, was typical of the very competitive nature of uh, the newspapers during that age, particularly. Uh, New York newspapers, and there were two uh, that kind of headlined this battle uh, for readership, uh, the New York Journal and the New York World. Papers like this would do almost anything to attract readers. And so the idea behind yellow journalism is a kind of sensationalism, almost tabloid style journalism. When you go to the grocery store and you see uh, newspapers like the Inquirer, this kind of faux journalism, um, you know, all kinds of crazy stories, you know, um, Bat Boy uh, flying through New York City. I think that stories that uh, many of which are not true. Others of them are the, these kind of celebrity based stories that may be true, maybe not. They're sort of um, a, a germ of truth to them. But the papers try to grab your attention, uh, whether they're true or not. And you kind of get sucked in, and the next thing you know, you're buying one of these papers. Journalism had not quite sunk to the levels of that kind of tabloid um, journalism that we see uh, today. But the papers in the 1890s were trying to grab our attention and get us to buy their papers. And so if we look at newspapers from that era, they implemented large headlines. They implemented um, lots of very interesting um, cartoons, which we, we'll um, look at several of these, uh, anything they could do. And so they were very drawn to the story in Cuba because it was so intriguing, uh, rape, torture, Death, mayhem, war. I, listen, these are awful things, but they also grab our attention. And Americans were buying these papers by the millions. And the message that began to come across in these newspapers is, why aren't we doing anything about this? Why is the United States standing by 
and allowing this to happen. And so we'll see these, these newspapers, the media begin to push President McKinley in the direction of intervening in Cuba. A second episode that contributed to the breakdown in relations was known as the DeLome Letter. This was a letter that was sent from the Spanish minister or diplomat uh, stationed in Washington, D.C., whose name was DeLome. And DeLome wrote this letter back uh, to Spain, as was commonly done, but it was intercepted um, by American uh, intelligence, and ultimately it was leaked to the media. And on February 9th, this letter uh, was published in the newspapers, and it created a firestorm of controversy. In the letter, the Spanish minister uh, spoke in um, derogatory or insulting terms about the United States, and especially its president, William McKinley. Among other things, DeLome described McKinley as weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. Well, my goodness, our own media tears apart our presidents today in far worse terms than that. But at that time, this was thought to be a grave insult. And there is a sense of... Um, that you might recognize, you know, sort of defending your own family. You can pick on your brothers or sisters, but if someone else calls them a name, you're going to stick up for them. So, you know, we might insult McKinley on our own terms, but when this piddling little Spanish minister insults the president, uh, we need to do something about it. And so um, this began to get the country really fired up uh, with this kind of anti-Spanish uh, sense. And the next event, the destruction of the Maine, um, pushes the country over the brink. Uh, and so six days later, on February 15th, 1898, the USS warship, the Maine, exploded in Havana Harbor. Um, 260 American sailors were killed. And the United States had sent the Maine down to Cuba, to Havana, as something of a warning to the Cubans. You need to get your act together. You need to stop this, uh, these methods that you've been implementing. Or we have this battleship at the ready um, to do something. On February 15th, the Maine exploded, and everyone in the United States was certain. How had this happened? Well, the Spanish, of course, had attacked and destroyed our warship. And so after this, the calls for war grew to just an incredible level. And in fact, uh, the president, William McKinley, found he could no longer prevent the country from going to war. Uh, the, there was just too much um, 